Hi, good morning. Not as full as last year. Last year there was a, the, the other room was full as well, so I have to step up my game now. Uh, please tweet about this session with the hashtag PHPUK and my Twitter handle, it's quite long. Uh, my notifications are off, so you won't bother me. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for introducing me. My name is Hannes. I, uh, I can describe myself with a couple of emoji characters. Uh, I'm a Belgian. I like to swim, cycle, and run. I work as a software engineer slash developer advocate for a company called GetStream.io. I joined the company six months ago. Um, we build scalable news feeds and activity streams. Uh, sh can you show me some hands? Who has ever set up a follower relationship pivot table? Right. Um, you probably know that um, when your user base grows, the pivot table gets enormously large. Um, and sometimes, for some people, like Twitter in the, in the early days when they had a lot of fail whales, um, their pivot table was basically so big they couldn't handle um, joining it with any other table because that would, it would go out of memory and it would be super hard to fetch a timeline for some user. So that's what we do. We build scalable news feeds and timelines and notification feeds and activity streams. So everything you, um, you see uh, in some social app where you can follow people, you can basically use our tool to build that feature and you don't have to uh, think about pivot tables or memory or whatever. Uh, so we have a page called um, getstream.io slash try the API. Um, it's super easy. I'll remember you after the talk as well. Uh, you can sign up with uh, GitHub or register with GitHub. It's totally free. And you can browse to our API and see how it works. Uh, but that's not what you came for. You came for this. You came for IOC container. Um, it's quite tricky. Um, let me first preface this by saying what this talk is not about. IOC. Uh, when I talk about IOC, I'm not using it, it as an acronym for uh, International Olympic Committee. That's not what it's about. Uh, you might think IOC container, uh, well, it's about Docker. No, that's not true either. Um, it's about inversion of control. Uh, but to understand inversion of control, we need to uh, understand a couple of design patterns first. So this is a quick, quick, quick five-minute lesson on design patterns. And there's no better way to show off design patterns by showing some code. So this is the first class I want to show you. It's a super s simple service class, and it has one method. And it calculates something. It gets something from storage, calculates it, ca does some calculations, and returns the result. It's super simple. We all have dozens of classes like this. Um, but to get something from storage, you actually need a connection with FTP. So we do a first um, design pattern here. We inject FTP into the service class. Um, basically, you want something that's already configured and set up and inject that into the constructor. So that's the second design pattern. First, I talked about um, dependency injection, which is injecting a dependency, something you depend on. So this service class depends on FTP connection to work. And the way we inject it is constructor injection. So that's two design patterns just in the first few slides. Um, so the project rolls along and some, um, some people come in and say, well, we are hitting quite a lot of FTP traffic here. Um, maybe we want, to, we want to add some caching. So developer comes in and says, okay, let's get this job done super quick. Uh, let's add a few lines in this service class where we actually do the FTP fetching. So we cache some stuff and prevent uh, the class from hitting the FTP over and over again. Um, now the QA engineer or whoever jumps into the room again and says, well, we want to know how, how, much, of tr uh, how much we actually hit this FTP server. Uh, so you add some logging. Again, a few lines to this simple service class. But now the service class does five different things. It gets s something from the FTP, caches it, uh, uh, logs it to monolog or whatever, uh, does, does some calculations and returns the result. That's a lot of stuff going into one simple class. Uh, that's kind of a code smell, but okay, it works, so we'll just deal with it. Um, but later on, we see that we depend a lot on FTP here. We de depend on FTP to get some stuff. We cache what we get from the FTP. We log what, the, what we get from the FTP. That's, that's a super easy refactor, right? Just get everything that has to do with FTP, the, the, the storage thing, and just extract it to a different class. 
That's the first step. That's the first simple refactoring we're going to do. So we create a new FTP storage class, and we just copy paste some code. Um, we give it a new method name, um, which is get, and then a key or a file name, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we refactor the service class to inject the, the FTP storage class instead of the FTP. Right? That's a super simple refactoring, and now this service class is super clean. It does one thing only, and that's uh, getting something, something from storage and return the calculation on that value. Um, the next step we can introduce is um, introducing interfaces. Right? The service class depends still on the super detailed FTP storage class, which is super low level. Um, it's super, yeah, super specific to this use case. Um, we might want to depend on something more abstract, maybe a, sor a storage interface. Right? Um, this is a, su a super simple refactoring step again. Just introduce an interface, um, make the FTP storage implement the interface, and refactor the service class to type in the storage instead of the FTP storage. Right. What we are left with is two classes and one interface, the service class and the FTP storage uh, class, which implements the storage interface. The next step is we can go back and refactor the FTP storage, which still does a lot of things. It's, fetch it's fetching from the FTP, it's caching it, and it's logging it. That's still three things in one class. So if you're striving for single responsibility, we can refactor that. Uh, by using this storage interface, we can start um, introducing some decorators. Uh, this is the first one. The caching decorator um, implements the same storage interface. It's super simple. Um, and it's basically going to wrap another storage class. It doesn't have to be an FTP storage. It could be a login decorator as well. So we inject a login decorator which wraps an FTP storage in here. We also take a, ca a caching implementation so we can actually remember what, it's, uh, what it has returned in the past. The same thing is true for the login decorator. It just wraps any kind of storage inter um, yeah, interface uh, typed thing. Could be the cache uh, decorator, could be the FTP storage decorator, could be an S3, Amazon S3 uh, implementation. So if you now look at the FTP storage, it's, it only has one responsibility left, and that's to get something from the FTP. Um, so I showed you a lot of code, but now I want to show you how the different classes and interfaces work together. In the beginning, we uh, started with this. We had a service class, which depended on an FTP storage, which depended on an FTP um, class. If you look at this graph, all the arrows go up, but the class at the top is like the most specific class. That's the most uh, low-level implementation that you have in this entire graph, which is um, completely the opposite of what you want. You want the low-level imp implementation to be at the bottom of your graph and to, go, uh, to have all the arrows go upwards. So after um, the refactoring, we end up with this graph. Um, we end up with a service class which depends on an interface, which is high-level. And then we have an FTP storage class, which is low-level at the bottom of the graph, which in, uh, in itself depends on FTP, which is still lower level than the service class. The service class d does no longer um, care about what the storage is. Is it an S3 storage interface? Is it, the, is it the caching decorator? Is it the login decorator? It doesn't matter. So all of these low level implementations and decorators, they're all lower level than the service class, which depends on any kind of these uh, implementations. So if we put them side by side, you see that the FTP class has become, uh, has moved from the top of the graph to the bottom of the graph. Um, so yeah, the design patterns I was talking about are dependency inversion. Instead of um, depending on uh, a low-level implementation, you're going to depend on a high-level abstraction. So all arrows are going up, and your low-level implementations are going down in the dependency graph. Um, the second um, design pattern is, is dependency injection. 
you're going to inject whatever you depend on, for example, the storage interface, um, through a constructor injection. So that's, uh, that's a form of dependency injection. Um, some, sometimes people use DI as the acronym for dependency inversion, and it's actually the same acronym as dependency injection, but they're actually two different design patterns, so keep that in mind. And then the last one actually works together with the, the top two, and that's inversion of control. Um, inversion of control, IOC, um, basically means um, you're no longer going to um, uh, let the service class new up a FTP storage, uh, like this. Um, in the beginning we had this. Uh, we create a new service and we inject an FTP. And at the end we had this, which is pretty much a lot of code, which we don't want to write. And that's where the IOC container comes in, right? Um, so instead of calling all of this, or newing up all of this inside the service class, we're going to reverse that and say, well, whatever it is, you're going to call me. Uh, you're g I'm, g I'm going to pass off control to the container. And I'm going to say, well, container, you're up. Uh, it's, it's your task to tell me what is going to be injected inside the service class. So I'm going to reverse the, the, met the, the object creation to let the IOC container itself do the object creation for me. So that's inversion of control. Um, when we use a container and say, well, get me a service class object, it's going to look up what, it, what needs to be done to create this service class object. First, it's going to create the FTP uh, storage class, then it's going to wrap it with the log decorator, then the cache decorator, and then inject all of that, well, the cache decorator instance, which is wrapping all the other instances into the service class. Note that. Um, the object that the service class uh, is being injected with is actually the cache decorator and not the FTP storage. But because the cache decorator implements the storage interface, the service class doesn't matter. It doesn't care what's being injected. So that's IOC. Uh, inversion of control uh, helps you with composing uh, all of these objects. Let the IOC container help you with composition. <coughs> Now, um, enough with the uh, gang of four um, de uh, design patterns here. Um, let's talk about the, the actual implementations we can find on packages. Uh, so there's a ton of frameworks, and all of these frameworks come with their IOC container. There's Symfony dependency injection, uh, Illuminate, which is a, a Laravel container, Aura DI, uh, Zen framework, Pimple, Lee container. And most of these implement uh, some kind of interoperable uh, interface. So there's container interrupt slash container interrupt, um, which is now deprecated in favor of the PSR11 PSR slash container package or interface. So last year on Valentine's Day, um, they basically deprecated container interrupt in favor of PSR11. So that's some love for the PHP fig. Um, this is what the, the interrupt container looks like right now. It just extends the PSR container, so it doesn't add anything to it. And this is what the PSR container looks like. It has two simple methods. Uh, the first one is the get method, which returns the result, uh, resolved object, or should return the resolved object. Um, and the second method is just a Boolean method, so it just returns yes or no icon. I can resolve this or I cannot resolve this. Right. Now let's, uh, let's talk about how this container works, right? the internals. That's what you are all uh, uh, interested in, I hope. So uh, the first way a container could work um, is by, undo by doing something called uh, automatic object resolution. That's just some fancy words for saying it's going to look at the, uh, at the constructor and see what needs to be injected. So to be able to create this uh, send invoice class, you need to look at the constructor because that's how you new up a new object. Uh, so the constructor has a mailer argument, which is type in the mailer. Now, 
we're going to uh, do some constructor injection here um, and use the container to do that. And if we use the PHP Lee container, we can tell it to use a reflection container. And this reflection container is using a PHP native feature called reflection. Um, and the reflection API goes like this. Uh, you pass in the class name to a reflection class object, you get the constructor, and you get the constructor parameters. And then you can loop those parameters and get, those, the, get the type hint, the type hinted classes of those constructor arguments. And the container is, is going to do that recursively. So if you go back to this, um, this send invoice class, the send invoice class needs a mailer object. But if the mailer object needs something else in, in that constructor, um, it's going to resolve those objects as well. So it's going to crawl down the dependency graph and find all the objects or all the type hints, resolve them from the container by doing automatic uh, resolution, and it, then it's going to inject it back into the send invoice class. So it's going to do it recursively, and basically all of the, all of the IOC containers have it. Uh, the Symfony IC container has it, the Zen, ha the Zen Framework container has it, Laravel, Lee container. Um, so that's the super easiest way. Just tell it to do automatic resolution and you don't have to help it. Just give me the send invoice class. It's going to look at the constructor arguments and recursively resolve those objects. Um, obviously, it only ends when there's one constructor without any arguments. Uh, so it can new up that object and roll, uh, go back up the dependency graph to inject everything into the send invoice container. Um, but I, I just basically told you to depend on an interface instead of a low-level implementation. So we're going to need to help the container sometimes. So if we would have type in the, the send invoice class with mailer interface, um, we're going to need to uh, tell the container which interface or which implementation to inject into the send invoice class. Um, so the first situation is uh, where we need to help the container is when we type hint an interface and we actually need some concrete class to be, um, to be resolved to inject there. The first way to solve this is to use aliasing. Right? We're going to tell the container, well, whenever um, this an object is needed with this interface, use this concrete class. Uh, in Laravel, it looks like this. Uh, container alias mailer interface uses concrete mailer uh, implementation. Uh, in Symfony, we can do the same thing with set alias. Um, and in most other, um, most other uh, containers, we can use something called a anonymous function, which is used to resolve this. So we can say, well, leak container, um, I'm going to add an anonymous function here, which you can call whenever someone needs a mailer interface object. And whenever someone needs a mailer interface object, call this anonymous function, and I will return you the result which you need to inject. So we basically ask, um, we basically tell the container, uh, here's an anonymous function, and trust me, I'm going to return a mailer interface typed object. Um, so we can create a super simple one line anonymous function that says container get mailer class. It just returns, the, uh, returns back to the container to say, well, here's the actual implementation you want to, in you want to be injecting. The second situation is um, when a constructor has arguments and one or more of those arguments are not type hinted. For example, um, you want, yeah, you have a constructor with two arguments and one is type hinted and one is not. Um, then basically the, uh, the reflection container or the reflection class uh, doesn't have any type hints. The container doesn't know what to inject in, into that constructor. So we're going to have to define those dependencies. In Symfony, we can do this. Uh, we can say register mailer add argument. 
Uh, we can call that add argument method multiple times to say, well, this is the order of the arguments you want to inject into that constructor whenever you instantiate the mailer class. For basically any any other uh, container, you can again use this uh, this struct of anonymous functions. So for the pimple and the Lee container, you can say, well, whenever a mailer interface is resolved, call this anonymous function. So it's the same principle here. Uh, it's kind of a factory method or a uh, anonymous function closure, whatever you want to call it, and you basically tell the container, well, trust me, if you call this function, I'm going to return you an object with this interface. The next situation is when a class is type hinted, I want to return, uh, I want to inject an object, but the next time this, uh, the I, want so I want something to be resolved, I want to return the exact same object. Uh, this is useful for injecting a translator uh, something with a, a global state. The translator has um, the the locale, um, which is global for the entire application, uh, or an entity manager. You only want one entity manager to be used into, into your entire application, or an event dispatcher, um, something that you want to share all over your application and you want to have the exact same object. So sharing an instance. Um, in Laravel, it looks like this. You do a container share. Um, in uh, no, you do you you do a container singleton, and in the Lee container, you do container share. Uh, and in Symfony, it says uh, register and then set shared to true. And basically, any container has this feature. Uh, some have this uh, sharing feature as the default. Some have it uh, disabled by default. So it depends on the container you're actually using. But you can define per dependency whether you want to reuse the same resolved object or not. The next situation is um, when you have um, different classes and they basically have the same type hint, for example, file system interface, but you want to inject different implementations or different configured objects. So, uh, for example, you have a file system interface and you have a bunch of controllers, a photos controller, a PDF controller, but you want them to have a different configured file system interface object. Uh, to do this, we can use something called contextual binding. Um, I, found, I found this feature in Laravel. I don't know if any other uh, containers have this, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's some other containers which have this. But in Laravel, it's super f easy. Um, basically, I do this. Um, I go to the container and I tell it there's different file system interface objects that you can resolve. Uh, and I'm going to name them. The first one I'm going to name file system.photos, file system.files, file system.pdfs, file system.avatars. Um, and I give them different names. So when there's a photos controller, I can say, when photos controller needs file system interface, give it file system.photos. And I do the same thing for different controllers. So depending on the context, in this case, the photos controller, I'm going to inject a different item from the container based on uh, the name I gave it. So this name is the same name I gave it when I registered it on the container. So I said container add file system dot photos. Whenever someone resolves this file system dot photos, give it this um, this implementation or this this uh, instance. And that's how you uh, you basically register different items, and you tag them or you give it the name file system dot photos, and you inject it in the right place. You can still do this in, in different containers as well. Uh, for example, in the Lee container, I just use a default um, anonymous function, and I say, well, when file system, f well, when photos controllers is resolved, I want to get container get file system dot photos, and I want to inject it as a first argument. It's as simple as that. The next situation is um, when you are resolving something for example, an event dispatcher or 
a uh, entity manager from Doctrine, um, you want to do something right before you inject it somewhere. Uh, for example, you want to resolve some, uh, you want to register some, some listeners uh, for the entity manager uh, in Doctrine. Um, I still want to resolve it in a normal way, but right before I'm injecting it, I want to register some stuff. For this, we can use a solution called container events. Um, some, some implementations call it inflectors, some call it hooks. Um, you can call it uh, a post-resolving or pre-resolving hook or event. Um, and I like it the most in the leak implementation. And the leak container has something like this. A container inflector, and then you give it a class name. Um, and whenever an entity manager is being resolved, right before injecting it into where it needs to be injected, it's going to call this class, uh, this anonymous function first. And it's passing in the entity manager as the first argument, the first and only argument. I can then call some methods on it. For example, get configuration, get the entity listener resolver, and regi register some entity listeners. Um, and this is being done right before the entity manager is being injected somewhere. Of course, when I share this entity manager, this is only going to be resolved. Uh, this is only going, going to be called once. Otherwise, I'll be registering the same model listener over and over again, which is not useful. Uh, in Lar Laravel, it looks like this. You say container resolving, and then you give it an, an anonymous function. And it's going to use the re same reflection API found in PHP, um, where it's going to look at the first argument of this anonymous function. And it's going to see, oh, well, whenever an entity manager is resolved, I want to call this anonymous function, because it takes an entity manager. Um, I use this feature a lot. Um, and I use it for different purposes. Uh, the first one is to inject something that uh, would otherwise require a connection with the global state or the global container. Uh, for example, uh, an environment. If you want to know the environment where you're working, like local or staging or production, that's, a s that's such a super simple string. Um, that I actually created an interface and a trade, which I just add to some classes that need uh, the context of the, con of the environment. Um, and then I tell the container, well, whenever something is being resolved with this interface, environment-aware interface, I'm going to inject the environment into the, into the object. This is just an example, um, but you can use it for more, more than one thing. You can use it for uh, injecting a command bus or injecting an event listener. Just add an interface, um, event listener aware, and a trait event listener aware, or event dispatcher aware. And whenever something is being resolved with this either one of these interfaces, I'm going to actually inject the event dispatcher or the command bus. Uh, that's for me, it's a super, super simple way to define dependencies and to inject them with a, well, this is actually a different kind of, uh, this is a different kind of dependency injection. Instead of de injecting it through the constructor, I'm going to inject it through a method. So it's method injection. I know some people are against this, but I like it. So um, the next uh, thing I like to use this for is for um, injecting soft dependencies. Now, sometimes a class needs a dependency, but it doesn't always need it. For example, um, d if you have a mailer class, sometimes you want to queue a mail. You want to just put it on a background job. So to be able to do this, you need a dependency on a queue class. Um, but it's not always that you need a queue class. So you want to new up the mailer, but you don't want it to know about the queue class before it's actually going to use it. So it's a soft dependency. You don't want to open up a connection with your, uh, with your message bus or something. So <coughs> what I'm going to do here is I'm going to inject an anonymous function which can be called by the mailer 
whenever it, it needs a queue. So it's an anonymous queue resolver, which I'm going to inject with method injection uh, with a set queue resolver method on the mailer. So whenever the mailer needs the queue, it already has an anonymous function it can call to resolve the queue class from the container. But it doesn't need to have a connection with the container because it has an anonymous function which it, it can call to create a queue class. So quickly, quickly injecting stuff, uh, in injecting stuff dependencies, um, but I also use it to inject, um, well, it's basically like the environment variable, um, it's injecting configura con ugh, configurable variables. So a lot of frameworks have something called a config class, which it can use to, uh, uh, to get some config variables. Um, so sometimes people let uh, classes depend on the config class of the framework, which is basically injecting your framework in, into your custom domain code. And I think, personally, that that is a code smell. So what I like to do uh, differently is I want to inject those config uh, things into the classes without actually injecting the config class as a whole. So whenever, this is just an example, whenever this validator is being resolved, there's a, a typo here, um, when the validator is resolved, I want to get something from the config and inject it through a method. So this validator, I would add a set allowed file types method on it, which I can use to inject config variables. So whenever the validator is being resolved, I'm going to use method injection to let the validator know, hey, here are the file types that are valid. Instead of injecting a complete config uh, object into the validator. So I get the config class from the container, I get the allowed file types, and I inject it through method injection. Um, so. That's how to help the container. Um, but now I want to, uh, um, yeah, w where do you put all this? Where do you put all the aliasing and the contextual binding and the resolving the callbacks and the, um, and the container events? Where to put all this? Um, there's another container interrupt um, project called Service Provider, uh, which basically says, well, you can put it in these service providers, and they can tell the container um, what needs to be resolved and how it needs to be resolved. There's a similar uh, thing called uh, service provider in leak slash container, and Laravel also has service providers. In Symfony, you can do the same thing in configuration files or in factories, and in Zend, uh, you can do the same thing with uh, factories as well and, and config and all, all these kind of things. And so every project has its own way of telling the container how to resolve something. Right. So we just told the container how to resolve something, but when are we going to use it? When and how are we going to use it? Um, basically, I prefer to use the container only in a limited set of classes or in a limited set of places in my entire framework or application. I don't want to inject a container in every single class of my uh, application. I don't want to make it global. I just want to use it in a s limited set of places. Um, for example, in the factory or uh, in an event dispatcher or in a router or a command bus. Basically, in places where you need to call other code, but you don't know up front what, what, the, what the code is going to be. For example, I want to call a, um, I want to call a controller, an HTTP controller, um, but I don't know yet how to resolve this controller. So I'm going to inject a container, and I'm going to say, well, container, now give me an instantiated photos controller or an instantiated um, send <coughs> invoice listener. Uh, so it's just uh, in a limited set of places where I'm going to actually use this container. 
So the first, um, the first and simplest way of using this container is to get something from it. So as I showed you before, the PSR11 container interface has two methods. Uh, the first one is has, the second one is get. And the first one just, it's a Boolean. Uh, can you resolve something with FS, or file system? And the second one is, well, now actually give it to me, please. Um, the second way, and this is not something that's in the PSR interface, but that's um, getting an object, but I want to use some arguments there. For example, I want to get the file system object, but here's an array of arguments. It's like passing in uh, CLI arguments if you uh, do a bat bash command. Um, so give me the file system, uh, file system object, but here are some arguments. Um, I use this to, uh, to get a file system object, but give me the images one. Uh, I use this to, uh, to quickly define the file system images, um, but always call the same file system resolving and give it an argument. So I would redefine the same block uh, for, for file system images, file system photos, file system PDFs, file system files, something like that. So um, another way to use a container and this is something that only a limited set of containers has, is calling functions um, and using the container to call an anonymous function to look at, to inspect the arguments of the anonymous function and to automatically resolve those. So, um, for example, in this line, I have an anonymous function with one argument, could be multiple. So whenever I call this anonymous function, um, I want the container to automatically resolve a mailer object and use it to call this anonymous function. Uh, so this is wh what it looks like in leak uh, in the leak container and in, in the Laravel container. Um, and basically, those three things here are all um, anonymous functions. So this simple array with two items is also an anonymous function. You can use this like any other closure. So the listener object has to be resolved, has to be an actual instance with a method handle. So uh, you can basically say, well, this is a closure, which is a simple array with two items, instance, and a method name you have to call on it. And then it's going to use the reflection API to find the arguments of the anonymous function. And the bottom one is also an, an anonymous function, given that listener is a class name which has a static method handle. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but all three of these are anonymous functions. So it's going to use a reflection function, uh, which is a class, in, in it's in native PHP. Uh, you don't need to install anything for it. Uh, you can get the callback, whether that's uh, uh, listener colon colon handle or the simple array form or an actual uh, defined anonymous function. Uh, and then you can get parameters, loop over those, uh, look at the type hints, and resolve those from the container itself. Um, and then there's another way to do this uh, in Laravel. Um, it's going to wrap an anonymous function this anonymous function can have multiple arguments. It doesn't matter. It's going to return an anonymous function without any arguments. So you can inject this into any other um, legacy code base and say, well, I still want to use the container, but I still want to use my legacy code base. So this is an in intermediate form where I can inject uh, closures without any arguments, and I still want to use the container to resolve stuff. And this is, this is what it looks like. It's a public function wrap, give it a callback with some arguments, um, and just return an empty anonymous function, which will call the same container. So this is uh, the wrap function is a, is a function of the container itself. Call itself with this callback, 
which will in, then, uh, in, in turn uh, uh, find all the, all, the, all the arguments and the type hints of the callback and resolve it. Um, the next feature I want to talk about is uh, tagging. Um, and I want to warn you first, uh, tagging in Symfony is not the same as tagging in Laravel. Um, tagging in Symfony is just a way of documenting stuff. And in Laravel, it's, it's actually adding tags uh, to items in the container so you can resolve all, all those items at the same time. For example, I use, I, uh, I use this file system.images and file system.pdfs a lot. Um, and I can use the container, or at least the Laravel container, to get all the file system tagged items from the container and loop over those. So if I have file system.images, I want to tag it with file system. If I have file system.photos, I want to tag it with file system too. And now when I ask the container, now give me all the instances that are tagged file system, it's going to give me an array of all those resolved instances. And then I can loop over all those instance instances, which I hope are the same interface, of course, and then I can do something with them. I want to maybe clear them, or I want to uh, copy them to S3 or whatever. Um, this w with this tagging, it's a super neat feature. Um, I can basically get all the same typed in instances from a container. In, uh, but again, I want to warn you, if you Google it and you want to use the same feature in Symfony, tagging means something completely different in Symfony. Um, since I have some time left, I want to show you some bonus slides. Uh, <coughs> I want to show you how to resolve circular dependencies. So I told you the container can do something recursively until it hits a, um, a constructor with zero arguments, and then it can roll back up to the dependency, dependency graph and inject stuff. Uh, but what if uh, there's a mailer class which depends on the queue interface or the queue implementation, and the queue implementation depends on a mail implementation or with some more intermediary steps? So if there's a circular... Uh, uh, yeah, a circular thing in your dependency graph, you might have a problem, or your container might have a problem. Um, for example, the mailer depends on the queue, and the queue depends on the mailer. Um, your container uh, will probably fail and say, well, I, I looped over this many, many times, and I couldn't resolve it. Uh, because it's recursively, it's going to keep a counter and stop at like 100 or something. Um, and the way to, st to stop this from happening is to use uh, something called, uh, well, I showed you before, uh, it's basically making one of those implementations or one of those dependency, uh, that dependencies a soft dependency. So instead of making the um, mailer have a hard dependency on the queue, I'm going to make the mailer have a soft dependency on the queue. So I'm going to add another method on the mailer class, which is the set queue resolver. Uh, which we we can then um, we can then use to tell the container well whenever the mailer is being resolved, so this is a container event again or an inflector. We're going to say well whenever the mailer is being resolved, right before returning it, here's an anonymous function to tell the mailer whenever you need a queue. Hey, you can use this anonymous function, and if you call it, I promise you I will give you a queue interface object. So um, that's basically it. That's a, that's a bonus slide. I want to quickly recap here. Um, so if you, use depend if you use dependency injection and depend uh, dependency inversion and IOC and all of those um, uh, design patterns, you might want to use a IOC container to compose all those objects. Because all those objects or all those classes are super small. Uh, they have one responsibility, single responsibility principle, uh, and it's super hard to compose all of that. And to do that, you use the IOC container to, um, to compose them and to call uh, a new service class or to create a new service class. And the container will know how to, uh, to compose that. Um, but you want to help the container by using aliasing and container events and soft dependencies and method injection and all those things to be able to compose all of that. And if you do that, you have super small, usable, um, unit-testable uh, classes. Um, 
and everything depends on high-level abstractions and not on low-level implementations. And when you when you draw the beautiful design graph or the, the the dependency graph, you will see that you have a lot of interfaces on top and a lot of low-level implementations on the bottom. Um, you can also resolve uh, circle, circular dependencies with soft uh, dependencies by making one dependency a soft dependency instead of two hard dependencies, which make a circular um, loop inside your dependency graph. Uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>